To Your Excellency, President Peter Tomka, thank you again so much for having been with us uh, for this conference, for delivering the opening keynote speech. I think in many ways you inspired the audience uh, as well as the other speakers and really set a framework for what has been a very rewarding conference. So we really appreciate your, your hospitality here Welcome. at the International Court of Justice and for taking the time. I'd love to talk to you a little bit more informally now regarding actually your role uh, as President of the International Court of Justice and the role of the court itself. Uh, now my understanding the International Criminal court uh, would be more the place where individuals would be tried in terms of you know, major human mm -hmm. rights violations, etc. Many think of the International Court of Justice as really the place, uh, the institution to protect human rights you know, at a state level around the world. Yeah. So first of all, if you could clarify, what is the relationship between protecting human rights at a global level and the International Court of Justice? Well, uh, International Court of Justice is uh, uh, main judicial body of the United Nations and uh, our role is to resolve, uh, on the basis of international law, disputes submitted to us by states. So these are interstate disputes. Individuals do not have access to the International Court of Justice. There are uh, different uh, mechanisms for individuals to assert their uh, rights on international plane under certain conditions. Uh, our court can uh, uh, deal with issues relating to human rights when a state either espouses the claim of individual in the context of diplomatic protection. Okay. This was, for instance, the case uh, when Guinea brought uh, a dispute with the Democratic Republic of Congo in uh, relation to the treatment of its national, Mr. Diallo, okay. in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, we also can uh, resolve disputes when states parties to human rights conventions uh, have a dispute concerning interpretation and application of a particular human rights convention, provided that the human rights convention contains a compromissory clause which grants jurisdiction to the court, or if the two disputing parties have made declaration under Article 36 of the statute recognizing our jurisdiction. Okay. Uh, occasionally, we also provide interpretation of some human rights uh, uh, instruments in the context of uh, exercising our second function, which is to give advisory opinions on the request of United Nations organs or specialized agencies of the United Nations system. So uh, <coughs> such opinion was, for instance, the opinion rendered in 1996 on the use of threat of use of uh, nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And then the court analyzed the relationship between human rights law and the international humanitarian law, which is a particular body of law uh, intended to provide for protection of uh, people during uh, uh, armed conflicts. Mm -hmm. Okay. And where do you see the main barriers to actually protecting human rights, you know, on the ground? In the sense, it's one thing if a law is passed in an international court, it's another thing to really have it implemented. Well, where are the main barriers? Uh, well, uh, people live in societies, in states, so uh, uh, it is the main role of the state to guarantee uh, human rights and to create a mechanism for uh, full implementation and realization of uh, human rights of individuals. So what is important is that there is a good governance, a rule of law okay. in the country, and there is a strong judicial uh, system, system of judiciary, where people, when they uh, believe that their uh, rights were uh, disregarded, violated, okay. they can seek uh, judicial redress. Okay. And the role of international law is to set certain universal standards, uh, human rights standards, uh, political rights, economic, social and cultural rights, civic rights, or to protect a certain vulnerable part of the population like children or women yeah. to fight against discrimination uh, based on sex or uh, race, etc. Uh, and then uh, the <coughs> role of international bodies, uh, if they've been given this competence, this uh, jurisdiction is uh, to control how these international obligations of states are implemented domestically. But I think always the main uh, sphere when human rights can be asserted is at the domestic level. Of course. Of course, no, and that's where the yeah. information yeah. in the end would have to take place. At the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, of course, we're always uh, aware of and sensitive to the cultural aspects when it comes yeah. to human rights or international law. How do you see the relationship 
between international law and culture. Uh, on the one hand, you can make the point it's irrelevant. You know, the law is the law, mm-hmm. and that's it, you know, in terms of protecting human rights. On the other hand, there's so much discourse and debate about, again, this respect for cultures. Uh, and uh, I respect your culture, you mm-hmm. respect my culture. Uh, and there's so many collisions uh, between the two. Uh, when one has a universal human rights declaration, uh, and then on the ground, especially as one looks at the African continent or the, in the Middle East, etc., mm-hmm. a lot of collisions. So how do you see this relationship and this clash sometimes between international law and human rights and culture. I do not think whether there is. I do not know whether there is a clash. Uh, I think uh, there are certain uh, basic uh, universal standards, and they have to be uh, applied and respected uh, globally. And of course, uh, on the other side, also uh, societies who respect have to respect the cultures of other societies, not to uh, be tempted to impose the particular views, uh, how things are to be organized, uh, uh, what should be the values uh, of the other societies. So uh, certain basic uh, standards, yes, on in universal level, uh, that would be the unity, okay. but at the same time maintaining uh, diversity. So it's, it's a balancing act. Uh, my next question to you is related to cultural diplomacy. Mm-hmm. I remember in our earlier conversation we were discussing this a little bit. And really the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy sees the role of cultural diplomacy to educate, enhance, and sustain relations. Uh, mm-hmm. To really build understanding and trust. And perhaps even to make it easier when there are potential clashes between international law and culture. What role do you see for cultural diplomacy, if any, uh, when it comes to international law and human rights? Uh, in the sense, you know, is it enough we have the courts, that's okay, or is there a role for cultural diplomacy to play in that regard? Cultural diplomacy can certainly assist in understanding uh, better uh, cultures of other societies, different societies, uh, uh, to explain certain uh, traditions. Uh, So, uh, uh, certainly it's... uh, a useful tool okay. of uh, creating a better understanding of uh, different uh, cultures, different peoples, different nations. Okay. Final question is regarding civil society. Uh, there's a lot of trends uh, to criticize the UN. Uh, you know, Syria, ISIS, this and probably it's, it's the UN's fault. Security Council, this, that, and the other thing. It's very attractive to point fingers. My question is, what responsibility does civil society have? In the sense, luckily, we've got a lot of institutions. We have the United Nations, we have the National Court of Justice. Uh, I think really the better question is, what is our job, or how can we support the UN? Uh, how can we actually you know, play our part? Uh, so that's kind of the question that I had for you, too. Where do you see the role and also the responsibility of civil society to support institutions such as the International Court of Justice or the UN? Well, civil society certainly can uh, voice uh, its uh, views. This may have impact on the political action taken by uh, governments, by the executive branches of uh, um, governments. Mm, and also uh, public opinion can call for greater respect for international law, because if international law is not uh, scrupulously observed, uh, experience shows that it leads to not only tensions, frictions, but sometimes even open conflicts, which have rather serious negative impact, disastrous impact on the possibility of people to enjoy their rights and freedoms. To conclude, I'd love to ask you one question about the future. Uh, You're now at the point almost concluding your tenure as president for the International Court of Justice. Where do you see the International Court of Justice 20 years from now? In the sense, what is your hope for how this court will develop or move ahead? Um, Where do you see it 20 years from now? Well, the court in the past 20 years has played a stronger and bigger role than uh, previously. This is reflected by the fact that more than 60 uh, interstate disputes were brought before the court in the last 20 years. And uh, the court has uh, made uh, great efforts to be more efficient and to decide uh, the cases in a timely manner. If uh, states really believe what uh, they preach, so-called rule of law, certainly they should uh, be much more willing to accept uh, more broadly jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, mm. so uh, not to uh, uh, come to the court when 
and they perceive that it might be useful for their particular interests mm. and also to be willing to defend their policies, their decisions, their actions mm. in case that other country uh, is of the view that uh, that is not uh, in conformity with international law. Uh, certainly majority of disputes among states are to be resolved uh, through negotiations that's the best way because it means that once the agreement is reached uh, both parties can live but the agreement usually uh, requires some compromises uh, if one party insists on its position uh, then it's difficult to <coughs> make the agreement with the other but also rule of law calls for existence of strong uh, independent uh, uh, courts where one can assert its rights or bring uh, a dispute uh, which it was not possible to resolve with the other party through negotiations. So uh, I think that uh, it's important that the uh, role and the uh, mm, functioning of the court is f further strengthened within the United Nations system. Okay. But uh, I'm firmly convinced that uh, the court functions as it was envisaged by the founders of the United Nations in 1945, okay. that the code uh, exercises its uh, function impartially, okay. independently, and that even smaller countries uh, sometimes were very successful in asserting their rights in disputes with uh, much uh, larger, bigger countries, because we decide on the basis of law, okay. irrespective uh, uh, who is before the court. Excellent. Yeah. Well, well, thank you again very much for your hospitality to yeah, host uh, the event here in the courts and thank also you. for sharing the perspectives. Yeah. And, and good luck in your further activities promoting uh, cultural diplomacy. Thank you. And uh, bringing uh, both communities together. Well, we look forward yeah. in partnership to hopefully bringing <laughs> yeah. more results to the field of international law and human thank rights. You. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.